good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did y'all notice something different outside? Sun. The sun. It's nice to see that today. Well, um, just some announcements for this morning as we get started. Uh, this Wednesday night, we will be concluding our Is Genesis History study, and that will be kind of going into more depth about uh, what we are That doesn't want to turn click. There we go. That's better. And not tinny like last week. All right. Um, we'll be concluding this Genesis history study, um, which will conclude it. We're going to be going through the importance of history, the doctrine of providence, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And you'll get a little preview of what that's going to be like, and we'll go into more depth Wednesday night again at 7 o'clock. Then this coming Saturday, uh, we'd love to have everyone join us. Doors will open at 5.30. We'll reconfigure everything in here. So instead of looking this way, you'll be looking that way, and that wall of windows will become a giant screen. It's a 12-foot diagonal screen, so plenty of room to see. We've got our projector mounted up here, and then we will have free concessions. So there's going to be popcorn and brownie bites. Lauren? Death no. Death Okay. <laughs> the brownie bites are kind of important. Death you got to have those. And so hot dogs, brandy bites, uh, drinks. So uh, and everything's free. We don't charge. Um, at the end of the service today, uh, for those of you who are here, you will get to see the trailer for the movie. It is an awesome movie that is inspired by true events. So uh, we invite you to join us for that. And then uh, yesterday we had the September races uh, for Orange Track Racing. And we'll be racing again on October 8th. That will be the next to the last race for the season. So we have October and November left. So lots of things coming up. Uh, I invite you to join us for all of those. And as I, I, I'm just kind of all worked up. At, at right now, I, I just want to settle down and, and ask a question. Do you remember where, now some of you weren't born yet, so obviously you, won't, you can't do this, but how many of you remember where you were at 21 years ago this morning? I was uh, I was working second shift at the time, and I happened to roll over in bed and just kind of turned the TV on, <coughs> and there was CNN, and I watched the second plane fly fly into the top second. I went to work and did not know I would be doing ministry immediately. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, employees at the time knew everyone in one of the offices on the 110th floor and they all perished. Mm -hmm. And so obviously she was just sobbing. Um, we ended up sending her home for the day, giving her a paid day off. And uh, then went to church on Sunday and found out that uh, our worship team leader's wife's cousin was the co-pilot of Flight 93 that crashed in Pennsylvania. These things that seem a world apart from us became very close. So this morning we remember all those that were on American Airlines Flight 11, United Flight 175, American Airlines Flight 77, and United Flight 93. We also remember those who perished in both World Trade Center, Building 1 and 2, the Pentagon, and then uh, while no one was killed on the ground, uh, we remember Somerset County, Pennsylvania. I'd like to take just a moment and have a moment of silence for those who lost their lives. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, as we remember those who lost their lives, not only on that day, but in the days, months, and years since in the war on terror, Father, we're reminded that you are in control and you are already there and you are already taking care of things. And as we will find out in your message this morning, Father, that not everything is going to be 
flowers and, and rainbows and bright and sunny in our lives. There will be times where we don't understand what is happening around us and why things happen, but there is a bigger picture that you have because, Father, you are a God of providence. Thank you, Father. In your son's precious name. Well, our call to worship this morning to get going with our message that comes from Romans 8, 28, and it says this, and we know that God causes everything, and I want to emphasize the word everything, to work together for the good, everything and good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God works in everything. For our good. And will, as I mentioned in the prayer, will everything that happens to us be good? No, not at all. It can range from be riding down, you're riding your bicycle down the hill on a gravel road and turning into your driveway, this is personal experience by the way, and hitting a pothole or a little dip. And this is back in the days of the, the handlebars that came up like this. And I went through those handlebars and I ended up just, well, shorts, gravel, they don't, you know, my knee didn't work out so well. Why did that happen? I don't know. It's a cute little scar on my knee now. But there's bigger things than that. We talked about 9-11 this morning. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think about everything for our good, but not everything is good, is Joseph. And we're in Genesis right now, so I think of Joseph. Why not? Joseph's brothers despised him. He had two dreams that he told his brothers and his dad, and they all thought he was crazy, that they ultimately would be bowing down to him at some point. So they, sl they made it look like he died. They sold him into, well, first they threw him into a pit. And he sits in that pit. And then they decide to sell him to some slave, or as a slave. He gets sold again once he gets to Egypt. He becomes the master of, the, of a person's home. Then the wife, well, she says, hey, he tried to attack me. So he gets thrown in prison. He spends a lot of time in prison until he interprets a dream. And what happened? He becomes the prime minister of Egypt, the second in command only to the Pharaoh. And through his dream interpretation, he is able to save Egypt and the surrounding areas from a great famine. And when I say great, I don't mean a good thing. I mean, it was a huge famine that could have killed not only the Egyptians, but also all of the Israelites because of the lack of food. And so he brings that on and he takes care of that. And then his brothers come twice. And then the second time, he reveals who he is. And what does he do? Does he blame them? Does he take it out on them? Does he take revenge? No. He says, it's me, Joseph, your brother. And then he loves on them. We don't always understand the bad things that happen to us in our life. But God has a purpose for us going through each thing. And sometimes... and. Wearing glasses, and you know, I don't have 2020 vision anymore. But when we look at the past, things are 2020. That's the saying, right? You look back, hindsight is 2020. Mm -hmm. We look back and we can see why God worked in that way in our lives. But here's the thing: in order for all that to happen, we have to go to what it says in Romans 10, 9, and 10. Because there, there's, a, there's a piece to this of, so that we understand what's going on. And Paul writes to Romans, he says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. We have to trust God in all circumstances, no matter what. Good, bad, ugly, indifferent, whatever is going on, we may not understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a friend who just recently found out she had a stroke last year. 
And she got through that, and she was, boy, she was relying on God. She knew she was going to get through that, and she's, all of that's starting to wind down. She's starting to get to the end of the physical therapy and all that, and she found out that she has breast cancer. And what has she done? She didn't, she's not saying, why, God, why? She's saying, all right, God, what's next? Show me. She's seeking God in it. And uh, definitely we'll be raising her Pam up in prayer later today. Um, just incredible what our faith can do and give us this hope that we have when we declare Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So we have to trust God in all circumstances, no matter what. It is what our hope comes from, and that hope is that we have security heaven with our Father. And that's what's going to lead us into the message this morning, which is the importance of history, the doctrine of providence. And yeah, another one of those big $20 words. We're going to pick apart providence and help you understand what it means and why it's so important. But first, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this. Morning. Thank you for the sun being out. It's refreshing to see that we needed the rain. But that rain often reminds us of when it's just dingy and, and not so great. But when the sun comes out, it reminds us of what happens when we openly declare that your Son is our Lord and Savior. Father, let us hear this message that you've given me this morning, Father. Let us understand that history is important. If we, if we have to understand it, and that will help us to understand this teaching or this doctrine of what providence is, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start with the first part of the sermon title, The Importance of History. Why is history important? And we've talked about this before, and you know, when we did the Truth Project, we were talking about that. And, and history is important because it is full of so much information about societies and really how people have lived. You know, Wednesday night we were talking and, and uh, we were talking about the changes in society and the things that people have seen. And, and I asked Harold uh, what he had seen. Because Harold's seen a lot in his 90-some years. He's experienced a lot in those times. And he is, and to this day, he is, he is such a godly man. And he has such wisdom to share. And we appreciate that. Thank you, Harold. But here's the thing, for better or worse, our history has brought us to where we are today. It has brought us here, our history. I mean, I can look back, and, and we talked about, you know, how God works everything in for the good. I didn't understand why my first marriage fell apart, why, why the things happened that they did. But ultimately, all those things and the decisions that I made and got because of God's providence and Him guiding and directing me, that I ended up here. Right here, right now. This is God's providence. And what we do today will be, well, wait a minute. It's already history. That's how quickly it goes. As soon as the words escape my mouth, it's they are now part of history. And that said, what societies and people have done in the past and up until now will matter for the future. Everything that we do matters for the future. How we handle ourselves, how we raise our kids here and now will matter in the future as to how they will act, how they will treat their friends and their family and their, if they have children, their children. So it matters for the future. And from the most basic to the most complex, we need to study and understand history so that those things that were not done correctly before can be done correctly in the future. Here's the thing, and, and this quote popped up rather randomly this week, and it's from Winston Churchill. Those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Here's the thing. Our society is doing its level best to erase history because it doesn't fit 
what they wanted to. It's not all light and fluffy and kind and it's difficult. In our history, and we can go all the way, I mean, let's go back to Pastor Mark's sermon two weeks ago, Adam, Eve, and the first sin. It goes all the way back to them. What they did matters to what we are, where we're at right now. And that, when we think about that, that seems like a lot of time. And, and you know, we were 2,000 years out from when Jesus was here. And at that point, it was about three, 3,500 years before that, that creation happened. If you hold to a younger creation, which we... That's my personal opinion. Um, I, that's not what we're here about today. But here's the thing. When we talk about that time, whether it's 5,000 years or 6,000 years or 3,000 years, whatever that is, God is outside of time. We like to put him in this nice, neat little box and put him in there and make him conform to our version of time when he is outside of it. And here's the thing. Time is important to God. It's important to God because we're in, we're in, we're the ones in the box, not him. God created time as part of the heavens and earth. And he continues to control everything that happens within time. Every moment is a connected link in this single chain of universal history. We talk often about how the, sing, the thread that runs through, and I'm not talking about the thread that holds the spine together, that holds the pages in, but from beginning to end, this book is about God's love for us and his son, Jesus. So every moment is connected. This is what the prophet Isaiah reveals to us. He reveals, it's God who's linking together his initial creative acts from the moment that we start reading in Genesis where he created the heavens and the earth and everything within it. And how those creative acts come together with his control of history. And the doctrine, doctrine associated with this control of history is what we call Providence, and that's where we're going to be today. Now, on Wednesday night, we're going to hear more from uh, Reverend Dr. George Grant, but I'm going to share this quote that he has with you. It says, with the Bible, you have this notion that there is providence, a purposeful plan by God himself that is then worked out across time in a linear, understandable, traceable fashion. It's made so that we can understand it. If it's not linear, if it's not understandable, and we can't trace it, we can't understand it. We don't have the mind of God in that sense to understand that. So that begs the question right now, what is providence? Well, here, providence is God's work of upholding the existence of the universe while guiding history to his designated ends. Now, Reverend Dr. James C. Petty says this. He says, the Bible teaches us that God does have one specific plan for your life. And the events and choices of your life irresistibly and sovereignly work that plan in every detail. And it has all your mistakes, blindnesses, and sins accounted for in advance. This is why we, we're dealing with an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God who knows everything. And though we are being allowed to make choices under free will, he already knows what decisions you're going to make. Now, this is a reoccurring metaphor in the Bible used to describe God's control over people and events, and that is the potter and the clay. Now, when we read the scriptures, we hear you know, one, one part of the clay may be an ashtray, one may be a pot, but he may, the potter may be making a beautiful pot. 
and then, oh, well, got to reshape it, and so it becomes a clump of clay again and gets remolded. And God is continually molding us into what we will be. He is actively shaping us, and through us, he's actively shaping history into the form that he desires. Listen to what he tells Jeremiah, and this comes from Jeremiah 18, 5 and 6. He says, Then the Lord gave me this message, O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And you see, not only is God acting throughout history, but he made sure that his actions were recorded accurately. And we've talked about this in this series of the re accurate recording of the scriptures. And how did he do that? He did that by revealing his actions to trusted messengers, such as Moses, Samuel, Isaiah, and so many others. And he had them write his message, and he had them do that under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And that is one of our doctrines that we follow here at Grace Street Church. This is part of our statement of beliefs. In fact, it's the very first part of our statement of beliefs, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It says this, it says the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, are the inspired and infallible revelation of God to man and the authority of faith and conduct. Grace Street Church accepts the Bible as the revealed will of God, as the all-sufficient rule of faith and standard for daily living. You want to read the rest of the statements of belief um, for those of you online the link is already in the notes there but go to Grace Street Church Grace Street dot church go all the way to the bottom of the page and just click on statement of beliefs God also interprets his actions so that they won't be misunderstood because if God gives us what he wants but we don't understand it what good is that to us and it's as a result of the fall that we struggle to understand. Because how many of you have opened the scriptures and read something and went, yeah, no. <laughs> I came back from Promise Keepers in 2003 after rededicating my life to the Lord. Giving him 100% and I was on fire. I Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Then I hit Romans. I read the first couple verses of the book and it's like, yeah, don't get it. <laughs> and I put the Bible down for a while. That mountain high I was on, not understanding, put me into a bit of a valley. But through God's teachings, and whether it was Bible study or whether it was going to church and worshiping on Sunday, all of a sudden, now I find out that as I read the scriptures, every time I read them, there's something new. There's something exciting to, to, to be in there. And I love that part of it. Now, again, as the, because of the fall, we do struggle to understand. And sometimes it's likely intentional that we overlook what God has said and done. Sometimes we don't like what God has said or done. I had a young lady in youth group who didn't like she, became, she went into high school. Before high school, she went on a mission trip and she led a Bible study on that mission trip around kids from all over the country. She hit freshman year high school and her friends got her doing things that they wanted her to do, the world wanted her to do. And so she, she looked at the Bible and she looked at, at church and she said, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know what? I've Still, with all my heart, believe that she knows Jesus as her Lord and Savior, but she turned because it wasn't the, the narrative that the world was feeding. And I pray, I pray as the scriptures say that she will turn back to the Lord and will seek him with all of her heart. And that that would trickle down to her children and her children's children. But both Isaiah and Peter 
refer, refer to this simple desire to ignore God's words and actions. And this brings us back to the doctrine of revelation that we studied in the very first lesson of this series. For us to know what he has done, God very clearly explains his actions by revealing them through his prophets. Now, the doctrine of revelation teaches us that it would be impossible to know God's actions, and thus he reveals them. And as a result, the doctrine of providence is directly related to God revealing himself to us. And providence explains why the creation reveals God's invisible attributes. So not only does God maintain creation's design, but he controls even the smallest details of its history. Let's listen to what Jesus points out here in Matthew 10, 29 and 31. He says, what is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin. But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. God knows. And, and when he says the very hairs of your head, whether you have hair on your head or not, doesn't matter. He's talking about the, your very being, every part of you, your thoughts and your desires and your dreams. He knows you more intimately than you know yourself. The doctrine of providence is essential to understanding God's involvement in history. The psalmist explains it like this in Psalm 33, 10 and 11. He says, the Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes. But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. Now, there are three aspects to our understanding of the doctrine of providence. The first is Jesus Christ not only created the world, but he continually upholds every aspect of it by his power. Listen to how the Hebrew writer of Hebrews says this in chapter 1, verses 1 and 4. He says, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, he created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. So, rhetorical question for you. Why is it necessary for the universe, which in Greek means all things, to be upheld by Jesus' power? When we create something, we make it, and we, more or less, we set it aside, and it exists. So think about that. Gutenberg created the printing press. Bless you. Bless you. He didn't physically set it aside and not use it. But what happened from that? Think of all the things. I mean, this doesn't exist without that. The words in this book, as we know them, do not exist without the printing press. Here's the thing. His life ended at a certain point, but what happened? The printing press continued, and it evolved, and it evolved. So we aren't needed for things to continue to operate. This is because the things that we make rely on God's sustaining power to continue existing and working. And as things change, things might stop being needed. And, and just because my wife worked there for so long, I'm reminded of the phone book. We don't use it anymore. So now she has a different job. Things come and go as God sees that we need them. But here's the thing. 
something has to be supporting the universe. It is not self-sustaining. The Bible tells us that God upholds the universe by his mighty power. Jesus must continue to maintain its existence at every point and every moment in time. Otherwise, it would cease to exist. And if time and space are an essential aspect of all things or the universe, and history is what happens in time and space, then what does that tell us about Jesus' role in history? Jesus upholds every aspect of history down to the very smallest of details. This complete control over history is often misunderstood. Not by God, not by Jesus, but by us. Because and I don't, mean, I don't take this personally, I don't mean it derogatorily, but it's because we are small, limited creatures. I mean, our, in, in the grand scheme of things, in, in just in the time that the earth has been here from the creation to now, is but this much that we are a part of it. And when we extend that into eternity, when we think about spending eternity with our Lord and Savior in heaven, it gets even smaller. So we are small, limited creatures. But people often think of God just sitting on his throne looking down on us. People think God is not actively engaged in anything that's going on. Here's the thing, that couldn't be further from the truth. That's like thinking... And, and I'll just use this position. That's like thinking the pastor that all they do is they show up on Sunday, they give a message, they go home, they do their thing until Wednesday night or whenever Bible study is. They walk into Bible study, they do their thing, and then they leave. And they don't do anything in between. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The Bible teaches that God knows all things because he oversees everything. This for me, and hopefully for you, gives you hope and encouragement. It should motivate us into personal holiness. Now, what does that mean? Well, living as children of God, we should be seeking to become more like God, in whose image we were created. So there's two parts to that. There's personal and mutual. So personal, this is on you. You need to study. You need to read your Bible. Sometimes that might include fasting. It always includes prayer. When we think about prayer, how often should we pray comes up sometimes. Well, how often did Jesus pray? He prayed morning, noon, and night. Well, there's a good example for us to start with. Sometimes I have one word prayers throughout the course of the day, depending on what it is, what I'm dealing with. But then there's the mutual aspect. This is where we come together, like on Sundays for worship, or uh, we come together for fellowship. Maybe it's for a meal or a movie or for racing league. We come together on Sunday and we take communion together. In about a month, I got this. This was back in the other room. We hadn't gotten it out yet, but in a, in a month, we're going to have a baptism. And it was exactly four years ago, I think yesterday, that we had our first baptism. Mm -hmm. It'll be their little sister. <laughs> but we're looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. But those are the things that we come together in mutual as one as we seek to become more like God. John MacArthur says Christian spirituality involves growing to be like God in character and conduct by personally submitting to the transforming work of God's word and God's spirit. If the conventional paradigm of the earth history sees events as being essentially random, how is God's providence the opposite of that view? Well, randomness ultimately has no direction to it. If it did, it wouldn't be random. That's what shoots that whole theory in, in the foot, so to speak. The doctrine of providence teaches us that ultimately there is nothing random in the universe takes us to point number two today. It says, God created the earth for man to live on, then revealed his creative work in scripture to ensure man knew what he had done. 
I'm going to read a couple passages from Isaiah 45 about this. First, 11 and 12, where it says, This is what the Lord says, The Holy One of Israel and your Creator, do you question what I do for my children? Do you give me orders about the work of my hands? I am the one who made the earth and created the people to live on it. With my hands I stretched out the heavens. All the stars are at my command. And then verses 18 and 19 say this, For the Lord is God, and he created the heavens and earth, and put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not to be a place of empty chaos. I am the Lord, he says, and there is no other. I publicly proclaim bold promises. I do not whisper obscurities in some dark I would not have told the people of Israel to seek me if I could not be found. I, the Lord, speak only what is true and declare only what is right. And the only time that we are seeking somebody and we don't want to be found is if you're playing sardines or hide and seek. Everybody knows how to play hide and seek, right? Sardines is one person hides, and then as you find them, you all stay with that person. The last one to find everybody is the loser. <laughs> and and, and I, we played this a lot at youth <laughs> lock-ins. Best place I ever found was the blue recycling bin. <laughs> Took first person over an hour. The last three or four gave up. That's when they banned anybody hiding in any of the bins, I don't know. <laughs> but this passage, it tells us that God created the earth to be inhabited by us. He created it for us. And when we look around at all the magnificent things, we see what God created for us. When we look around and we think back that it, it was just a little over two years ago that the derecho went through and destroyed so much. But... When we look around and we see what God has done and filled back in, this is humbling to me that God does this just for us. God created it so that we would have a place to seek him and to know him. Now, you all know me well enough that by this point I have got a song stuck in my head. And that song is based on Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 through 8, or excuse me, Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8. And the song was originally written by Pete Seeger, and some of you maybe know what that one is. It's called To Everything There Is a Season. But a few years later, the group The Birds took that song. They renamed it Turn, 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 and took it to number one back in 1966. And that's the one that got stuck in my head was Turn, Turn, Turn. Now, for those of you that know the song, you're welcome. It's stuck in your head. <laughs> but remember what I said earlier, that time is important to God. How does God view the timing of his creation events and the importance of that timing to his purposes? Well, God talks about creating the earth and placing man in it, stretching out the heavens and all their hosts. God reminds us that through his powerful word, he spoke everything into existence. So think about that. He spoke it all into existence. See, he's speaking into existence one thing at a time, like tree and this flower and that flower. No, dry ground was created all at once. So what we now know as North America, what we know as Africa, what we know as the Philippines, all created at once. The sun, the moon, the stars, and all the galaxies, all at once. The fish and other live birds of every kind, great sea creatures, every sort of animal. Not one at a time, but all at once. Every type of vegetation, whether it was the plants or the trees or whatever it was, it was all at once. When God speaks of these events in Isaiah, he is referring back to the events that were recorded in the first chapter of Genesis. And not only does he draw our attention to what he did, he also draws attention to what he said about it. What did he say about it? Do you remember? He said, it is good. And then he also said one other thing. He said, it is 
very good. God wants his people to know exactly what he has done in history. Mm -hmm. What God has done should be a source of trust for us. He wants to know that what he did was intentional. Genesis and the history contained in it are the foundation for us to know who he is. Now, here's a question for your parents. Have you ever wanted your children to come to you looking for answers? Mm -hmm. yes. See, I remember, and you all know that I work a second job. I work as a technician for one of the cell phone companies. I started there. I get an Android phone. This, uh, before that, all I have was like candy bar or flip phones. Right? Mm -hmm. I get this really cool Android. And Diane's daughter gets the same one. It's like, this is what I do for a living now. If you have any questions, I have the answers. Come to me. She never came to me for once. <laughs> I was so disappointed. But as parents, we want children to come to us for the answers. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to go to him for the answers. He wants us to look to him and not rely on ourselves. And there's a proverb that speaks well of this. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not depend on your own understanding, but seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. See, God is a mighty, transcendent God who personally interacts with the people that he created, and he always speaks what is right and true in ways that we can understand. The conventional view of history is that the earth has been around for about 9 billion years, that the universe is you know, 13, almost 14 billion years. This is a view of time and history that is opposite of what Isaiah tells us. Isaiah says God created the earth to be inhabited by man. That's his purpose for it. He created it specifically for us. There's no suggestion of a slow or evolutionary or a billions of years long process in that passage. It presents creation as it happened. Earth, man, and everything else. God then says he revealed the way he did it so that man would know and worship him. Now the conventional view, it says that there was no earth in the universe for the majority of the universe's history. And it did it slowly formed. Just over time, it slowly formed. It took billions of years to evolve into something that could support life. And no. In terms of human life, 99.999, just take that out as many nines as you want, percent of the history of the universe is one of silent emptiness based on that theory. That takes us to our last point today. God has ordered when and where people live in time so that they will seek him and repent before the coming judgment. Mm -hmm. Now in Acts 17, verses 22 and 34, Paul goes before the council and he addresses them. And he is addressing the men of Athens. And these, these men, there are, are altars all over Athens that have different gods on them, but they have one. One that says to an unknown God, and he takes that and he uses that. This is the God that created you. This is the God that created everything. And he uses that altar and that statue to explain what God has done and what, why Jesus came. Paul introduces the Athenians then to the unknown God who is our known God. He tells them that everything was made through him, that he is Lord of heaven and earth, and that God is in control of even the basic functions of our lives. This tells us that God's power and knowledge are absolute, and we oftentimes don't consider how our lives are controlled by when and where we're born. On Wednesday, we're going to talk, you know, it talks about, we'll talk about how a person who was born in China in 1240, so that's going back a bit, to poor parents would live a radically different life than a person born even in the 1800s or the late 1800s in America to middle class parents or to a person 
born in India just 21 years or 22 years ago to wealthy parents. That is all going to be so different. People born today in other countries live such different lives than what we have. But God desires us to seek him and know him and worship him. And that's why he tells us, and that's why one of the last commands Jesus gives us is to go out into all the world. Now, as Paul is going through that passage, he went back into history. He did the history, yes, the importance of it, in order to explain all of it. And in that passage, in those uh, 12 verses, Paul never mentions Jesus' name. So if you want to read it when you get home, Acts 17, 22, and 34. But Paul never mentioned Jesus' name. In fact, it's the mere fact that he spoke of the resurrection that the people there spoke out against him. Now there's going to be scoffers. Jesus took that. Paul had that. Peter had that. We have that. But the actions of God in history are essential to knowing who he is. And the doctrine of providence teaches that God directs our steps in order to seek us, or in order for us to seek him out and know him. God's creation of the world and his complete control of history is for a purpose, and it is to bring us to one thing, salvation. And that salvation is through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. It is a great mystery to consider that Jesus created and upholds the world, and yet lived as a man, was crucified, and rose again for our salvation. But again, remember, God, so that includes Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, lives outside of this box of time that we are so accustomed to. And this is a mystery that the authors of the New Testament teach us. And they, as they are teaching, are aware of its mysteriousness as well. What they do not treat as mysterious is what God said in the past. God has clearly recorded what happened in special revelation. From whether it was the, the six days to Adam and Eve to um, being formed in his image to the universal effects of the sin or the fall to the judgment that led us to the flood that Mark talked to us about last week to the salvation in Jesus Christ. The Bible is an accurate book of history that God expects us to know and trust. I leave you with this passage from Romans 11, 36. It says, For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. What a perfect prayer. For those of you who are watching online, if you are here locally, let us know if you would like to have some of these cups so that you can take communion with us each Sunday morning. This is a wonderful reminder of what we just talked about, God's providence and his sending his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. He did this, and, and Jesus is having this meal knowing that he is about to die that he is about to fulfill God's purpose for him here on earth the first time around, which is he is the final sacrifice for our sins. So Paul records it in 1 Corinthians 11 like this. He says, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he broke the bread into pieces.
pieces and he gave it to the disciples. Later in the meal, he took the cup of wine. And he said, this is the new, or this is the cup, is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. I look forward to the day when we take this meal in heaven with Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Father, thank you for what this meal represents. The hope and encouragement that we get from this. There's a hope and encouragement that tells us that you are in control of everything. And that you are guiding and directing our every step. Even when we're making bad decisions. Father, guide us and direct us through the remaining days of our lives. In Jesus' name. Sister Kim uh -huh. is out of ICU and oh, good. will be in rehab, but still has mm -hmm. many, many issues. I'll put her on and this. a young lady I've known forever uh, is on her way back from practically Canada by herself today driving, so prayers that she gets back okay. And what is her name? Allie. Allie? She was one of my high-level generals really? until she graduated high school. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm keeping you in prayer today, too, because I know you've had some health issues, and so we'll keep God in prayer. And so let's go to God in prayer. <coughs> Psalms 117, 1 and 2. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you people. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. We thank you, God, for all things, for life and breath each new day. You guide our steps by day, and you watch over us by night. In Romans 10, 9, 13, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you have done for us that we can come to you in prayer and thanksgiving and ask for healing of our bodies, hearts, minds, and souls. And you are there in the midst of our trials. You are a great God and worthy of praise. Father God, we ask for prayers for Pam that has breast cancer and Kim that has breast cancer. And um, Father, we know that they are faith warriors in you. 
and we just ask for healing of their bodies. We ask for protection over their families and themselves, especially Kim as she travels to, to visit her family, Lord Jesus. I pray for protection over her. Give her energy and strength for each new day that she is gone and, um, and healing power throughout her body, Lord God, that she feels your presence with her at all times. And Kim also, or Pam also, Lord God, for she is a faith warrior. She is just a strong person, Lord God, and just be with her and comfort her through this trial, Lord Jesus, and help her to help others that are going through the same thing. For you do not let us go through these things for nothing. You give us strength and uh, courage to help others with what they are going through as well. We ask for um, travel mercies for Mark and Allie always. Keep them safe and protect them as they travel wherever they are going throughout their day. And this week, Lord Jesus, be with them. Help Allie get home from Canada and just be with her each and every day that she is on the road. Keep, keep um, a close presence with them, Lord Jesus. We ask for healing for Becky, Don, and Denny, and Denny's sister, Kim. Lord God, we ask that you supersede in their lives Cleanse whatever is causing their issues of dizziness or pain or swelling and cancel it in Jesus' name. I pray for Steve, my husband, that the blood of Jesus wash over his shoulder, arm, and body and restore him, Lord, according to your will. I pray for Atlas and Kim's family and friends. You have heard the request for help for their family members, Lord, and for their friend with cancer. I pray continued intervention for all of them. You know each person fully well. Please help each one according to their personal needs and your will for their lives. Please walk with Atlas and Kim and their family. Wrap your loving arms around them and give them strength and energy for each new day. And we thank you, Jesus, for this family. And I pray, Lord God, for Harold, Jen, Ann, and Al, who faithfully serve you, Lord. I ask for continued comfort of mind, heart, and soul. I ask to bring caregivers that will help them through this life that you have granted them. I thank you for their lives, their knowledge, their wisdom that they share with others. We are truly blessed by these people, and we thank you for them in Jesus' name. You are so good to all of us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for your things for all things and let your will be done on this earth for you alone are God and there is no other praise be to God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Ghost in Jesus name Amen, Amen. God's people are gifted, and God's people have things that they give back to the church, and certainly that is a blessing to us. Thank you so much. As we prepare to close out our online portion of the service this morning, I send you out with the words that the Lord gave to Moses for Aaron and his sons to bless the people. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace.